I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Christmas Day has finally arrived. And although 2020 has put us all through the ringer, this year has made most of us appreciate the true meaning of Christmas. It's not about what game systems you buy your kids or how many of your relatives you can fit around the dinner table. What Christmas is really about is peace on earth, goodwill towards man, and bad will towards the many awful holiday movies which are pumped out on a regular basis by both Hollywood and the Hallmark Channel. And while there's still rigorous debate over whether Die Hard or Batman Returns can qualify as Christmas movies, there's one unconventional holiday flick out there that too often gets left out of the debate. A certain lump of cinematic coal that we like to call Reindeer Games. When the year 2000 rolled around, Ben Affleck found himself on the top of the world after winning himself and Matt Damon an Oscar for writing Good Will Hunting, and beginning to prove his mettle as a big name movie star. But the 21st century started off on a sour note for the future Batman, when he starred alongside fellow beautiful person Charlize Theron in this holiday-themed heist thriller, with Affleck and Theron under the direction of cinema legend John Frankenheimer, best known for such masterful 60s thrillers as The Manchurian Candidate, Seven Days in May, and Seconds. Yet despite the high caliber talent behind Reindeer Games, the movie hit a speed bump after its test screenings were met with mixed reactions, forcing its release date to move from Christmas 1999 to February 2000. And considering that audiences weren't in the mood for a Christmas movie on fucking Valentine's Day, neither critics or audiences wanted to join in these Reindeer Games. And not only would the film be John Frankenheimer's final theatrical effort before his death two years later, but it also be the first in a series of increasingly bigger disappointments for Ben Affleck, which thankfully led to Affleck coming back as both a respected director and actor. So let us turn the clock back 20 years to find out whether Reindeer Games can close out the 2020 holiday season on an appropriately crazy note. And since we'll be watching the original director's cut of the film, I'm eager to see that controversial deleted scene where Affleck gets pissed off at a bunch of Christmas carolers. Jingle bells, Batman smells, Robin Why did you say that? <laughs> Only three minutes into the review, and I've already pissed off all the DC fanboys. To all a good night, everybody! Since the grocery stores don't carry any figgy pudding, we'll have to fire up our good tidings with some wassail instead, after letting poor Rudolph join in on the awfully good drinking game. Take a shot or drink every time you again hear Ben Affleck intermittently narrating the movie, as we open over shots of dead Santas, one of whom is Affleck himself. Tell you the truth. I never was much for the holidays. We then rewind to six days ago, as Affleck introduces himself as the story's protagonist, Rudy Duncan, a car thief who's about to be released from a five-year stint at a maximum security prison, at the same time as his cellmate Nick Cassidy, played by Spock's dad from Star Trek Discovery. With Nick particularly eager to get out so that he can finally meet the girl who's become his romantic pen pal over the past few months, Ashley Mercer. I've made my list and I've checked it twice, and as long as you're naughty, it's gonna be nice. You, my friend, will walk out of the bus fare searching for the drunkest skirt in the room. That's right. Morning, gorgeous. More eggnog. And if you folks are surprised at the cringeworthy Christmas jokes that litter the dialogue of this movie, then take a good look at the names of our two prisoners. Rudy, Nick, Rudolph, Saint Nick. Clearly, this is going to be a dark and gritty reboot of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, where Rudolph and Saint Nick are now two escaped convicts led on by Rudy's bright red nose through a brutal snowstorm, while on the run from the corrupt warden known as Buford Pratzer. Rudy and Nick. They'll go down in history. Actually, the plot is set in motion when Rudy finds that a prisoner named Alamo is back in his cell after a stint in solitary. He thinks I'm the reason he ended up in solitary. Fuck Rudy. And although Rudy and Nick are eager to avoid Alamo's wrath in the lunchroom before their big day, things go awry after one of the inmates finds that the prison's jello is rife with cockroaches. What? Oh, it's just a roach, Sam. 
Yeah, it's protein. It's good for you. Well, no wonder this inmate is so disturbed over this roach-infested jello. He's played by music legend Isaac Hayes, a.k.a. Chef from South Park. You should have had him working in this lunchroom. He would never tolerate cockroaches in his chocolate salty balls. Look at this shit! Son of a bitch! Look at this shit! You call this flop? Real slop has got chunks of things in it. This is more like gruel. So as armored guards swarm the lunchroom to break up the ensuing riot, Alamo sticks a shiv in Nick's side, but is stopped by the guards before he can do the same to Rudy, who tends to his dying friend in his final moments. Oh my God, Rudy. Okay. No, Ashley, I couldn't be there. God, Jesus, God! What I guess I'm saying is, Rudolph, with your chin so tight, won't you fuck my girl? tonight. Nick! So when Rudy is let go from prison the next day without Nick by his side, he's left with a difficult choice. Either leave Charlize Theron all alone at the prison gates or take Nick's place since she doesn't know what he looks like so that Ashley won't be left heartbroken for the holidays. Well, since we wouldn't have a movie if he just left her there, I guess Rudy has no choice but to pose as his dead cellmate. You Ashley? I'm Nick. While using all the information that Nick read to him about their relationship. I was scared you'd see me and I just wouldn't be that picture that you had in your mind. I figured you walked out of there and you saw my clothes or something and you just walked right the other way. Uh, look you two, let's cut the crap. Both of you happen to be some of the sexiest actors working in Hollywood. Had these two characters been played by Steve Buscemi and Penny Marshall, then I would understand their hesitation for a relationship. But this is Batman and Furiosa we're talking about. Now both of you merge your genetically perfect bodies together and give us a steamy sex scene. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Yeah, nothing gets your boner raging like the music of Dean Martin. In fact, I think that was one of his album titles. So after Rudy decides to stick with his new identity and flushes his driver's license down the toilet, yeah, good luck waiting in line for three hours at the DMV to get yourself a new one of those, you dumbass. It seems as though Rudy's scheme to romance his dead cellmate's pen pal will go off without a hitch. Until that is, he gets ambushed inside of his cabin by a gang of thugs, which is led by... Lieutenant Dan! What the hell happened, Lieutenant Dan? I thought you had cleaned up your act after marrying that Vietnamese woman and getting your new legs. Now you're back to your post-Vietnam look? Indeed, that's Gary Sinise playing the role of Ashley's trucker brother named Gabriel. And yes, we're still going with the whole naming characters after famous Christmas figures thing. As Gabriel was informed through Nick's letters to his sister that Nick used to work security for a nearby casino and wants to use Nick's knowledge of the casino so that Gabriel can rob the place on Christmas Eve while most of the guards have gone home, along with some help from his fellow truckers. Jumpy, played by Machete himself, Danny Trejo, Merlin, played by Clarence Williams III of the Mod Squad, Purple Rain, and Half-Baked fame, and Puck, who was originally set to be played by a pre-fame Vin Diesel but is instead played by character actor great Donald Logue after Diesel left the project following disagreements with John Frankenheimer to do Fast and the Furious instead, with Charlize Theron following Diesel's lead into that franchise a mere 17 years later. I read your letters, convict. Don't play no reindeer games with me. You know that dropping the film's title wouldn't have meant anything if you'd seen this movie under its alternate European title, Deception, a title that's slightly less bland than just calling it Action Film. Rudy keeps insisting to his new captors and new girlfriend that he is not Nick Cassidy. I, I was in the joint with him. That, that, that's how I knew about him and her. You're not Nick Cassidy. You were saying you were. So you could get with my sister. So you could get down her chimney. By the way, ladies, if the shape of your vagina resembles that of a chimney, then please seek medical help. Now, if any of you have seen the Homie the Clown episode of The Simpsons where Homer is hired to pose as Krusty the Clown, you'd remember the joke where Homer tries telling Fat Tony and his thugs that he's not the clown that they're looking for. I'm Homer Simpson! The same Homer Simpson who crashed his car through the wall of our club? Barney Gumble. The same Barney Gumble who keeps taking pictures of my sister? Joe Valachi. The same Joe Valachi who squealed to the Senate committee about organized crime? This is precisely how things play out between Affleck and his captors here. Affleck keeps insisting to the thugs that he's not the man they're looking for. That guy who wrote that letter? That's Nick Cassidy. I'm not him. The gang responds by deciding to do away with Affleck. Bury this guy all over the place. Oh. The scared Affleck changes his mind and says he really is the man they're looking for. Nick, I love you. I had better sex in prison. 
and the gang believes without hesitation that he's now telling the truth. But not before Nick slash Rudy gets the one thing he's been hankering for after getting out of prison. The first thing I'm going to do, go out and get myself a mug of hot chocolate. A piece of pecan pie. You want to hear about some job of mine? I want to see some goddamn hot chocolate. And some pecan fucking pie. Well, you're in luck, Mr. Affleck. Come on down to Friendly's and celebrate the holidays with a slice of our famed pecan fucking pie. Then wash it down with a tall cup of god hot chocolate. It's all part of our fucking holiday dinner special. I can really go for some onion rings. <laughs> now available with our sucking onion rings. Only at motherfucking Friendly's. Get the fuck in here and eat some fucking food, you fucking fucks. So Rudy as Nick must use what little he remembers from Nick's letters to orchestrate the robbery, including the safe that the casino's manager uses to skim money on the side. And it was called the powwow safe. Powwow safe. Powwow safe. In the powwow safe. Millions. But since he knows nothing about the layout of the casino, he tells Gabriel he needs to scope the place out again after claiming it was redesigned while he was in the slammer. And his captors oblige him by disguising Rudy as one of the village people. You're sending me into an Indian casino dressed like a cowboy. It was that or a ballerina. And when Rudy and Ashley head into the Tomahawk Casino, which would most certainly not have that name anymore in the year 2020, we meet perhaps my favorite character of this film, Jack Banks, the casino's manager as played by the late great Dennis Farina. Banks has a backstory which could easily make for its own movie, as he's a transplant from Las Vegas who's been hired by the Native American owners of this dumpy roadside casino in Michigan to give it some Vegas flair. I can't go back to Vegas, Bear. I can't go back, they'll kill me. And the Indian tribe is far from pleased with his underwhelming results. I cannot give you Las Vegas profits until you people get together around a campfire, smoke a pipe, and do some kind of fucking spirit dance about this goddamn snow. Now oh, look, fellas, I'm sorry for being insensitive. How about I make it up to you by giving you two tickets to the Washington Redskins game? While Farina, Sinise, and all the other character actors here play these criminal scumbags with their expected panache, Ben Affleck is a bit young and clean-cut to play a two-bit car thief who just got out of prison. If this had been the older and more rugged Affleck from Gone Girl and The Way Back, he'd have knocked it out of the park. But at 28, he's still too wet around the ears to convince in a part that 90s era Nicolas Cage could have played blindfolded. What did you think's gonna happen? This thing's gonna be over and just gonna let me go? He's gonna shoot me in the back of the head like this! I'm glad he did that hand motion to convey what shooting someone in the back of their head looks like, or else I would have been totally lost. But Affleck is a less baffling casting choice here than a Dude Where's My Car era Ashton Kutcher, who pops into the film for an inexplicable cameo as the poor schmuck who trades clothes with Rudy so that he can escape from Gabriel and his thugs. Oh man! It's your jacket! You can have it! He gave me a hundred bucks! Shit. You know what? This Ashton Kutcher kid is pretty good at playing tricks on people. That might make for a good MTV show someday. What's also inexplicable is the choice that John Frankenheimer makes behind the camera to film his actors in extreme close-ups at a skewed angle that suggests another infamously bad movie from 2000, Battlefield Earth. I mean, no camera should be this close to Danny Trejo's face. His face is scary enough as it is. But Frankenheimer isn't solely to blame for this movie's flaws. The other part of the blame goes towards Miramax for the 20-some minutes they cut from this film after not just the mediocre test screenings, but also an objection from the MPAA over the scene where Gabriel tortures Rudy for his escape attempt by throwing darts into his body. Throwing darts at a worthless ah! fucking ah! convict! Ah! Three darts is too much! Sure, it may be silly, since I'm pretty sure those darts would have to be razor sharp to puncture his skin, but it doesn't exactly elicit passion of the Christ levels of discomfort. I'm more distracted by Affleck's attempt to act like he's freezing cold by rolling his eyes back into his head. It brings back bad memories of his performance as Daredevil. Another movie where the villain attacks somebody with darts. Oh wait, he actually used paper clips there, but there were darts in that scene. Point is, stop doing movies with dart attacks in them, Affleck. What did they do to you, Nick? That's a... points to me. <laughs>
However, Rudy is smart enough to keep one of these darts on him to free himself from having his foot cuffed to a hotel bed. But on his way to escape, he hears his lady love screaming inside the hotel pool, where he finds Ashley splashing around with her supposed brother Gabriel in one of the movie's many surprise twists. He wants to rob it. He wants to rob you. From where I stand, the only thing he's been doing right so far fucking my girlfriend. Oh my god, those fiends! They're using the hotel pool even though the sign clearly says it's closed! I must inform the hotel management! So with Rudy failing to make his getaway once again, he must now participate in the Christmas Eve heist of the Tomahawk Casino. You gotta be kidding me. Oh. Oh. With the robbers walking into the mostly empty casino disguised as department store Santas looking to unwind from a long day of work. No more toys for the kiddies, but we do have charitable donations. Good fat man with flying horse, give quarters please. And Rudy gives Gabriel's gang a diversion by hilariously flipping out on an old man who's kicking his ass at the poker table. And go get another table! Throw people! You're, 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 you're taking Santa's money! Yeah, what kind of a people cheat Santa Claus? Oh, big deal. Like, this is the last time that Affleck's gonna get in trouble at a casino. Santa Claus is kicking the shit out of your guards. And while it's hilarious enough to see a bunch of Santa Clauses robbing a casino like this is a holiday-themed heist mission for GTA Online, this scene gives John Frankenheimer a chance to show off his talent for well-paced action that he previously demonstrated with the famous car chases from Ronin and the scene in Island of Dr. Moreau where Marlon Brando wore an ice bucket on his head. Plenty of bullets fly between these bad Santas and the casino security guards, especially when Donald Logue receives an unpleasant surprise after breaking into the money counting room. Oh. Poor guy should have read the sign they placed on the door, don't open till Christmas, motherfucker! And where the rest of the movie largely had Charlize Theron acting like a helpless damsel in distress, this is where she takes charge by driving her car through the casino's doors and revealing her true intentions of evil to Rudy. No future, just more of the same. You want a future, you gotta stand up and steal it. You can tell she's evil now because she's wearing a black shirt. But their plot begins to unfurl after Jack Banks confirms to Gabriel that this supposed Nick Cassidy is not really Nick Cassidy. Not Nick Cassidy. Rudy Duncan, honey. We still gonna spend Christmas together. What a shock this is. It's not like this guy had told them this very same thing several hundred times already. Rudy insists to the gang that he wasn't lying about the powwow safe that Jack Banks has behind his desk. Although he was lying about the contents of the safe. Pow. Wow. How oh, wow. Ladies and gentlemen, this may be one of the greatest things I've ever seen in a film I reviewed for this show. Dennis Farina shooting a bunch of Santa Clauses with fucking double guns. Hey Santa Claus! Welcome to the Tomahawk! Now I'm really pissed at the Oscars for forgetting to include Dennis Farina in their in memoriam reel. Because this clip could have easily been used for his segment. Things get even more badass when Rudy takes down Merlin using the water gun that they gave to Rudy as a joke before the heist. With Rudy replacing the water beforehand with whiskey. An idea he obviously stole from Frank Reynolds on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. What do you say to Santa's dwarves? Hmm? You say thank you. Welcome to hell! Well, look on the bright side. At least Clarence Williams' death will inspire his son Prince to finally finish the lyrics for Purple Rain. I only wanna see you lit on fire a Santa suit. So now that we finally know where all those dead Santas at the star of the movie came from, Gabriel and Ashley confirm to Rudy that they were two grifters sending mail out to imprisoned convicts to find one who would fall in love with Ashley and help them stage a big heist. And since Rudy took Nick's place after his death, he'll have to be killed while the two lovebirds make off with all the money. Guy takes a shift for you, you go chasing his girlfriend. Don't talk to me about greed. But when Rudy asks Ashley how she could know that Nick got killed in prison with a shiv, she doesn't hesitate in shooting Gabriel dead to take him to that great big Bubba Gump shrimp company in the sky and reveals her actual boyfriend who cooked up this complex scheme. Merry Christmas, Rudy. That's right, our asses just got shy Amelon. Because not only is Nick alive, but Ashley's real name is actually Millie Bobeck, the bartender girlfriend that Nick went to prison over for a bar fight. No, you're 
Used to serve drinks to these gun running truckers, scheming about a real score one day. With Nick having Millie pose under a new name to lure both Gabriel and his trucker friends and Rudy into Nick's plans to rob his old casino, and Nick paying Alamo to slash him across the ribs to fake his death. <laughs> Come on, Marta. This is stupid with two O's. Look, folks, that's the simplest way that I can describe this twist ending. It's as stupid as stupid gets. This is the kind of deceptive trickery that you would expect from characters in an Agatha Christie mystery. Not a bunch of low-level crooks living in fucking Michigan. What do you think's gonna go wrong, huh? Thousand. You think we don't know what a long shot is? Yeah, I know what long shot is. It's a Charlie Theron movie with a less stupid ending than this one. But as Nick and Millie prepare to shove Rudy out to his death inside of a flaming car, it happens that Rudy has a trick up his sleeve. And by trick, I mean knife. He has a knife up his sleeve. Two one! Never put a car thief behind the wheel! And Rudy uses the hijacked car to crush Nick's legs and run over Millie. Between this movie and Prometheus, what is it with Charlize Theron and her inability to jump out of the way of oncoming deadly obstacles? But thank fuck she never played Indiana Jones. After Rudy subjects both Millie and Nick to a fiery death, he must now return the stolen cash to the financially strapped Native American owners of the casino who desperately need it. Oh, who am I kidding? He walks down the streets of Michigan on Christmas morning and drops a chunk of cash in each mailbox he finds. Never mind that the approaching authorities will likely confiscate all this money back and put Rudy back in jail for another 50 years. It's Christmas, goddammit. And that means that Rudy plans to make good on the other plan he had for his post-prison activities. All I want is just to make it back to Sidnaw. Sit down for Christmas dinner. Watch some ball with my old man. Sleep in my old bed. Eat some of that Christmas turkey. The lesson to be learned here, my friends, is that if you conduct a casino heist that leaves several innocent people dead, then you will be rewarded with a reunion with your estranged family on Christmas Day. Like I said, I never was much for the holidays. Until now. Ah, uh, it's great to have you back home, son. Uh, say, can you pass us the cranberry sauce there, Aunt Martha? 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 Martha! Why did you say that name? Charlize Theron claimed in a 2007 Esquire interview that she only did reindeer games in order to work with John Frankenheimer, and that it was the worst film of her career. And seeing as she said this before starring in A Million Ways to Die in the West and The Huntsman Winter's War, I have to firmly disagree. Sure, it's a silly as hell movie that can't be taken seriously as a heist thriller, but its silliness is clearly intentional, and whether or not that works for you is a matter of personal taste. And though I don't think the theatrical cut and director's cut are terribly different from each other, the more brutal violence and extended character detail in Frankenheimer's cut give it a slight advantage. So if you want to close out this year with a delightfully shitty orgy of sub-Tarantino dialogue and gun-toting Santas, then make sure to stuff reindeer games in your style. Followed up by watching another annual Christmas tradition, the Clarence Williams III Yule Log. God bless us. Shut up, bitch! And on the nudie watch, both the theatrical and director's cuts are blessed with a plentiful bounty of Charlize Theron buttage and boobage. And even some of Affleck's bat ass. But thankfully, no Gary Sinise nudity. Although IMDb claims that Sinise and Charlize Theron were romantically involved at the time of this film's shooting. No, that can't be true. Charlize Theron actually having sex with Gary Sinise is more unbelievable than anything else in this movie. He looks like Randall Weems from Recess, for God's sake. No offense to Gary Sinise, who is a great actor and human being, despite looking like a rat boy. Thank you for your service, Lieutenant Dan. On the enjoyableness continuum scale from Boulder Bruce, Reindeer Games is the closest we'll come to getting a full-length version of The Night the Reindeer Died from Scrooge. It's Lee Majors! And gifts the baby Jesus with an eight maids of milking out of ten. As for whether surviving Christmas counts as a Christmas movie, well, that's another awfully good holiday special for another year. I'm Jesse Shade for JoeBlow.com, and thanks again for watching our show. If you like what you see, subscribe to our Joe Blow videos channel, tell all your friends who enjoy this type of content, and turn on the bell of St. Mary to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all your support, especially after this past year that's been hard on all of us. So I wish all of you out there a a very Merry Christmas and a far happier New Year. You know, um, Sandler's. No, it's Sandler. 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 Sandler.
Little. <laughs>